It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first question this morning is to the Premier. Ontario's regional public health units are only now getting a better look at the chaos in store for them from this government's public health scheme. Yesterday, we saw the preliminary geographic boundaries for the Premier's reckless scheme to eliminate 25 public health units. Large cities like Ottawa and Kingston will now share a public health unit, whereas the Renfrew public health unit will be sliced down the middle. Who did the government consult to draw up these boundaries, Speaker? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, I thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question, but in fact, the boundaries have not been decided upon yet. There are uh, numerous consultations that have yet to happen. There were some discussions that happened by phone last week with the uh, Medical Officer of Health upon the suggestion of boundaries, but they are only suggestions. They have not been decided upon. There's a lot of consultation, particularly with municipalities, that is yet to happen. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it's clear that the government's proposing that, to, for example, Waterloo, Peel, Halton, Wellington and Guelph regional public health units all merge into one. Chief Medical Officers in Hamilton and Niagara are still struggling to figure out how the merger of their regions will even work, much less what the impact will be on the services that they provide to people in those communities. While the government cooks up these schemes behind closed doors, people who actually work in public health every day are worried for their communities and their jobs. Why is the government keeping public health units in the dark while they force through these risky changes? Minister. The purpose of this uh, proposal is to make sure that we modernize our public health system, to be able to respond to, to crises in public health that do occur from time to time, and we can probably expect it's going to occur even more frequently in the future. So we need to be ready for it. That's what we're preparing for. As for the public health units being left in the dark, that is absolutely not the case. They have been consulted. They have had conversations. There are many more discussions that have yet to be had, and as I indicated in my previous answer, no boundaries have been decided upon yet. That was going to be decided after appropriate consultations with municipalities, with the public health units, and with others. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, to cut first and plan later is irresponsible. To do that in health could be catastrophic for the people of our province, Speaker. The Premier's attack on our regional health care systems will impact every single part of our province, and this kind of chaos will only harm the people who depend on their services. And I find it disgraceful that cabinet ministers are laughing side, at this order. prospect, speaker, speaker, because I can tell you people in public health are certainly not laughing. They are very, very, very concerned. In response to the news in Waterloo Regional, in Waterloo, regional Chair Karen Redmond said this, I have grave concerns. The farther you move away from local decision-making, the greater the opportunity there is for less responsive and accountable decisions. Why is the Premier reducing accountability and imposing a one-size-fits-all scheme on communities across Ontario? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The modernization of our public health system is something that we've been working on for months, and the change from the uh, 35 units of public health to 10 is something that is we are working on through the, uh, through the consultations that are necessary with the appropriate people involved. So this is not uh, something that's just been thought up in the last minute. This is something that's very purposeful, has been thought about in great detail by many people, and it's something that is going to be subject to further consultations with the people who are going to be dealt, dealing with this on the front lines. We want to make sure that our local public health units are going to be able to respond to uh, issues that are going to come up from time to time. There are outbreaks of certain diseases. That's going to continue. But we, so we need to be ready. We are ready at the uh, Ministry of Health, and we are, want to make sure that local health units response. are going to be ready to deal with this as well. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Yesterday, the Toronto District School Board released their proposed operating budget for this year, which had a $42 million hole because of the government's cuts to education. In the past, the school board has been able to make up shortfalls in their budget without affecting students in the classroom. But this year, the board says it's not possible. 
The programs and services for students will need to be scaled back, is what they're saying. Is the Premier ready to admit now that his education cuts are actually hurting students? Questions to the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, our government is about making sure the students are ready for the new economy, making sure that they're ready to get out in the work world. The numbers that the, TD, the, numbers that the TDSB put out was absolutely reckless. They put these numbers out to the public premature Opposition before, order. before they even know the numbers. They're just throwing these numbers out arbitrarily. Our ministry's numbers are totally opposite, Mr. Speaker, and it's disheartening that they move forward with these figures without first attempting to even verify the accuracy of these numbers. It's the old scare Opposition tactics, Mr. Order. Speaker. Political stunts like this only serve to cause anxiety with parents yeah. and with students. Fine. Over the past 15 years, there's been zero oversight, zero oversight and accountability when it comes to the education spending at our school boards. The school boards are out of control. Stop the clock. I'm going to ask the member for Davenport and the member for Waterloo to come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the Premier only knows that it needs to hold up a mirror to see reckless, out of control and premature. One of the programs that the Premier's cuts to education is hitting is the French Immersion and Extended French program. Students will now have fewer opportunities to participate in French Immersion because the board is first forced to reduce the number of pathways into the program, and fewer students are able to be bused into schools to access the program. Does the Premier believe that forcing schools to cut essential programs like French Immersion will actually help students succeed? Premier. Well, this year, Mr. Speaker, we're giving the TDSB $3 billion. And, Mr. Speaker, we're asking, them, we're asking the TDSB to find three quarters of 1% efficiencies. Three quarters of 1% of efficiencies. But guess what the school board does in, instead, Mr. Speaker? They go out and waste taxpayers' money. They spend over $700,000 to replace some locks. Locks on schools. The TDSB, these are great ones. To replace one electrical outlet, they spent $3,000. For a $2.50 outlet, they spent $3,000 to install it. This is even better. One of those whiteboards, the whiteboards that cost $127, the school board went out and spent $2,500, Mr. Speaker, on a whiteboard. This is reckless spending over and over again. We see they forward. went to one school, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, I think the Premier should check if it was a whiteboard or a smart board. Maybe he doesn't know the difference, Speaker. French immersion is not the only program that is going to be cut back because of the Premier's education cuts. The International Language Program, the International, the International Baccalaureate Program, the Outdoor Education Program are all seeing cuts. There will be fewer uh, psychology staff, fewer supports for teachers to boost their skills in science, math and technology, and fewer opportunities for students to learn music and art. Is this the kind of change the Premier thinks our students deserve, Speaker? Premier. Mr. Speaker, I think the public needs to know how they waste money at the school board. Seven hours, Mr. Speaker. Order. Seven hours. They hired someone to hang three pictures. Seven hours. But it even gets better. For Essex, they call the order. same company up that spent seven hours hanging three pictures to come two days later, and they took eight hours to hang three more pictures up, Mr. Speaker. It's outrageous spending we see. They went out and spent $143 on a pencil sharpener. That is reckless. They cut one single key, a single key that cost $5 at Home Depot. They spent $147 to cut one key. At R.H. McGregor, at R.H. McGregor, they need a little bench move, Mr. Speaker. The school board hired four guys to come by 
to move one bench. That's the reckless spending. We're going to stop. We're going to make sure there's transparency. There's accountability. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. I knew the Premier wanted to be the Mayor of Toronto. Now he wants to be the Superintendent of the Toronto <laughs> District School Board. My question is to the Attorney General, though, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Today's Globe and Mail. Order. Today's Globe and Mail provides more details of a disturbing incident last year in which Dean French, the Premier's Chief of Staff, ordered senior political aides to direct police to raid cannabis stores the day the marijuana became legal, with the goal of getting people in handcuffs on the noon hour news. The Globe reports that the Attorney General attended a follow-up meeting in which these same staff were reprimanded by Dean French, the Premier, and senior cabinet ministers for not following through on Mr. French's orders. Can the Attorney General confirm that she attended this meeting, and if she did, did she actually take the time to explain to the Premier how inappropriate it is for politicians and their staff to attempt to direct police? Questions to the Attorney General. The Solicitor General. What? Referred to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the NDP might not get it, but I think the vast majority of Ontario residents understand that our goal is to compete complete and, and uh, ensure that our families and our communities are safe. Um, the fact that chiefs of staff and ministers, frankly, are asking for updates suggests that we want to make sure that the policies and legislation that we are bringing forward is actually making a difference to the frontline officers. You know, I, I continue to appreciate and understand, and I wish the NDP would, that these illegal cannabis shops fund opioids, fund human trafficking, fund guns and gangs in our community. We must shut them down. And the only way that we can do that is monitor to make sure that the policies and legislation that we have brought Response. forward is actually making a difference to the frontline officers. That's what we're doing. That's what our staff are doing. And we will continue to do that. Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the government staff who refused to do Dean French's bidding did Order. so for a very good reason. In a democracy, the government does not dictate who police investigate or how they conduct investigations. It's a concept, sadly, that the Ford government seems to have a problem with. Side, come to order. The Attorney General, however, has a unique role at the Cabinet table, and this is exactly the sort of moment when she should have spoken up. Why did she not speak up, Speaker? Stop the clock. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but I have to call members to order. The Premier must come to order. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services must come to order. The Minister for Infrastructure must come to order. The Minister for Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade must come to order. While I'm at it, the Member for Eglinton Lawrence will have to come to order. The Member for Etobicoke Centre will come to order. Start the clock. Solicitor General to reply. You know, our, uh, our government understands and appreciates how important law and order is in the province of Ontario, and we will continue to monitor the activities of these illegal cannabis shops because, as I say, Speaker, it is critically important Opposition that side come understand to understand this is a source of funding for guns and gangs in the province of Ontario. Yep. This is funding human trafficking in the province of Ontario. Mm -hmm. Illegal cannabis shops are funding opioid prices in our communities. Oh, if the NDP doesn't understand why it's important that we know that these illegal cannabis shops shut down, then I can't, I can't attempt to infrastructure come to why order. they don't understand. Chiefs of staff need to have the input and Stop the clock.
the Minister for Infrastructure will come to order. The Minister for Infrastructure is warned. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order. The, leader for, or the Member for Waterloo will come to order. For repeated interjections, if you're wondering why. The Member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. The Premier will come to order. I want to apologize to the Solicitor General for interrupting her response, but I had to call one of her colleagues to order because of repeated interjections. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Aurora Oak Bridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the federal government adopted the job-killing carbon tax on April 1st. Sadly for the people of Ontario, it was no April Fool's joke. People across the province, from all walks of life, are feeling the impact of the carbon tax. Hospitals, universities and colleges, businesses and seniors across Ontario are paying the price. No one's exempt. The Prime Minister better take note because Canadians are growing angry. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier please update the Legislature on the status of the carbon tax challenge? The Premier. Well, I, want, I want to thank a great MPP from Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. He's a champion like the rest of these champions. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I had an opportunity to, to host uh, Premier Scott Moe from Saskatchewan and, and talk about the uh, carbon tax and the effects it's taking place right across this province, right across this country. It's not a coincidence, Mr. Speaker. Every premier that ran against the carbon tax has won, from PEI to New Brunswick to Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. The people of, of Canada do not want a carbon tax. It's a job-killing tax. It puts a burden on the backs of every single family in the entire country. It puts a burden on every single company that exists. Everything is going up, my friends. Everything the people up there are buying today is going up in price in the stores. Their gas is more expensive. Everything is more expensive, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Premier for his very, very eloquent answer, as always. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Ontario will be paying $648 more a year because of the federal government's costly carbon tax. Instead of having a federal Liberal government that is looking to make the lives of Ontarians more affordable, we have a government in Ottawa that is doing the complete opposite. The Prime Minister has an anti-competitive agenda, and the people and the job creators in my riding are feeling it every day. Mr. Speaker, the same motley crew that brought Ontario to this dire state is now playing an encore for all Canadians. Now, that, now thank goodness that our Premier is working hard every day to make it easier to get ahead in this province once again. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier reassure Ontarians of his commitment to defeating their, this carbon tax? Premier. I'd like to thank the, the member for the question, Mr. Speaker. I can assure every Ontario resident we're going to use every tool in our toolbox to fight against the most aggressive, worst tax this province has ever seen. Again, it makes us uncompetitive. Every company I talk to, to it makes us uncompetitive, Mr. Speaker. But through our great Minister of Environment, he's come up with an incredible plan to make sure we have clean air, clean lakes, clean parks. We're leading the entire country with 22.5% emissions reduction, as the rest of the country is a positive five. We're minus 22.5%. We're going to hit our 30% target in the next 11 years. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? We did it without a carbon tax. A job killing carbon tax. We will not, we will not stop until we get rid of this carbon tax. But, Mr. Speaker, in October, the people will decide in this country if they want a carbon tax or not, and I'm betting that they will vote this government out. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Thank you. 
Start the clock. The next question, the member for Kiwetno. Miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Premier. Recently, there was a devastating fire in the community of Kitsunabeksup in Inuwak, also known as Big Trout Lake. Five community members died in this fire. A mother and uh, four of her children, all under the age of 13. Chief Donnie Morris uh, has issued a declaration of emergency because of the fire's impacts on the community. Using Jordan's principle, will the government help uh, the youth, uh, community's youth, who are most affected by the fire and need mental health supports? Miigwech. The question is to the Premier. Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Energy, Northern Development and Mines. To the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I share, I know on behalf of my colleagues, our deepest condolences with the victim's family and indeed the uh, community of Kitchenamekuzib in Anawag. I had a chance to speak to Chief Donnie Morris, a person I've known for a great uh, number of years. We pledged our support not just in the immediacy of uh, the investigation by the coroner and, and various other uh, urgent supports, but to continue to provide uh, any supports that he requested. Uh, he said that he would be in touch with me as those needs arose, and I pledge uh, additional support for mental health services as they would be required. Uh, it was a good conversation under a difficult set of circumstances, and we remain committed to supporting that community during this difficult time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Uh, back to the Premier. Um, the fire in uh, Big Trout Lake is the latest uh, to claim lives uh, in the First Nation. Fires in Pekanjikam, Mashkigogamang, and Wanaman Lake also had very tragic outcomes. First Nation residents are 10 times more likely to die in a house fire than the rest of Canada. It's not good enough to just to feel bad. It's not good enough. It's not enough to just to have those moments of silence. There are actions that could be taken to make events like this, less likely, so it doesn't happen again. Will the government commit to working with First Nations to improve fire safety in our communities? Minister. Ask the members to take their seats. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to recognize my colleague, the Minister of Children and Youth Services, who spoke uh, about Jordan's principle at the House of Commons uh, last week. The member opposite is, is right. It is more than just about moments of silence and action. Uh, it's more about action, Mr. Speaker. That's why uh, we responded uh, to this fire uh, very quickly, reached out to the Chief. In fact, uh, resources from the Government of Ontario were mobilized immediately. The Chief acknowledged that, and we remain committed to supporting uh, the community. Uh, we'll take our cue from the leadership of that community in terms of what additional support they re will be required, and it will be there, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, it is very clear that Ontario has a housing crisis. Homes are too expensive to buy or rent, and supply just hasn't kept up with demand. Last year, three-quarters of Ontario households couldn't afford the average price of a resale home. More than half of renters found the average rent for a two-bedroom just too much for their budget. That is, if they could even find a quality rental in the first place. This is the result of 15 years of neglect by the previous Liberal government. They increased red tape every chance they got, making it even more difficult to build the housing our province so desperately needs. Can the minister please explain to this House and to the people of Ontario what our government is doing to increase housing supply in Ontario? Questions to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker, and I want to thank the incredible uh, member from Oakville North Burlington for all the work that she uh, does on behalf of her constituents. Speaker, I was honoured to speak this morning at the Toronto Region Board of Trade about more homes, more choice, here, here. Ontario's Housing Supply Action Plan. 
And the member is right. Uh, it's clear that uh, after years of mismanagement and inaction on this file by the previous government, there's a shortage of housing in Ontario. There are not enough homes for individuals and families who need it. Speaker, it takes 10 years, 10 years to, to build a low-rise or high-rise housing development in the GTHA. Our plan and legislation aims to speed up the time it takes to build housing across all of Ontario by cutting red tape, reducing unnecessary delays, duplications Response. and barriers. This is going to make it easier to build more homes and provide more housing choices more quickly while maintaining protections to people's health and safety and the environment. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Speaker, it is clear more housing of more kinds needs to be built. Unfortunately, there is a major backlog of legacy cases at the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal. It is a two- to three-year appeals process. At a time when Ontario is in a housing crisis, Speaker, this is unacceptable. It's estimated there are approximately 100,000 housing units that are caught up in those legacy cases at the Tribunal. That's 100,000 desperately needed homes and rentals that can't get built or three years' worth of construction in Ontario waiting to be approved. Speaker, can the minister tell this House how the tribunal will be able to expedite decisions made more quickly in order to get more housing on the market? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, and again, I want to thank the member for that excellent question. Speaker, thanks uh, to the support of our fantastic uh, Attorney General. Uh, we're adding as many as 11 new adjudicators to the tribunal. Speaker, that's a 45 percent increase. We're proposing changes that will broaden the tribunal's jurisdiction and, in major land use planning appeals, allow it to make the best planning decision. We're also proposing to, uh, to changes to encourage the use of mediation to simplify the processes and remove potential delays. We're also giving the tribunal greater discretion regarding its fees to make sure that the barriers are removed for those seeking to launch an appeal. We're moving towards, Speaker, a more cost recovery model so that developers Response. pay more for the system, not the people of Ontario. These changes are going to eliminate the backlog, reduce the delays, and ensure the LPAT can unjam that log jam and get units created for the people who need them. Thank you. The next question is the member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Last week it was released that the Minister of Labour is cutting $16 million from the office tasked with preventing injuries and deaths in the workplace. The minister is cutting $16 million from the office despite the fact that it's not taxpayer-funded and does not impact the government's bottom line. Speaker, workplace deaths are going up and up, not down. My question to the Premier is this. How many more workers need to die in workplaces before he stops the cutting the services designed to protect them? To the Minister of Labour. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. We've actually increased our health and safety budget enforcement by over half a million dollars, Mr. Speaker. We take the safety of uh, workers in this province very so, uh, seriously. So, look, at, in order to help to protect what matters most, we asked our partners at the Health and Safety Associations to find $12 million in savings by exploring opportunities to implement efficiencies, leveraging third-party revenue, restrict, restricting discretionary spending on items such as non-essential hiring, traveling, training, and events. So, um, you know, Mr. Speaker, we had important decisions to make, putting people as a priority. We have looked at health and safety programs. We have worked with the partners that deliver these health and safety programs. Response. And Mr. Speaker, there are other avenues of revenue for them to provide the programs, Mr. Speaker, but we have, as I say again, increased our enforcement budget by half a million dollars, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier. 
When asked about the government's 16 million cut to health and safety, a lawyer with the Industrial Accident Victims Legal Clinic said, and I quote, it will ultimately lead to more accidents. No one person should go to work in the province of Ontario and not know if they're coming home at the end of the day to their families. Slashing funding designed to protect workers, forcing training sessions online, and creating unaccountable classes will make workers less safe. The government said they are slashing health and safety in this province because it's cost efficient. So my question is this. What exactly is the value of a life question. of a worker to this government? Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, uh, I mean, I have to reject the premise of this question. Of course, the health and safety of workers are of utmost importance to this government. Uh, you know, we actually. I, I will repeat again for the member, we actually increased our spending on occupational health and safety enforcement by half a million dollars. Yes, we have the Ontario Health and Safety Associations. We work with those partners. We told them the reality of the province's financial situations. These are private organizations that receive revenue funding from multiple sources. Look at Mr. Speaker, we have the priority of workers in mind in health and safety. We increased the enforcement budget by half a million dollars, Mr. Speaker. There are other revenue sources Spons. for health and safety programs to be delivered, Mr. Speaker. We'd worked with our, our uh, partners in these programs, Mr. Speaker. You know, modernizing health and safety programs so more people can actually get health and safety programs is not a bad Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, yesterday afternoon in the legislature at the end of debate, a young woman stood in the member's gallery to express her dismay that the government members had not supported an opposition day motion put by the NDP to declare a climate change emergency and to develop a real plan to deal with that emergency. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that Ontario had taken action to reduce pollution. The fact that the Minister of the Environment can stand in his place and claim confidently that Ontario is on track to meet its targets is because another government, our government, did the heavy lifting. Coal plants are shut Order. down, cap and trade was in place, there are more electric vehicles on government the road, side, come buildings to order. were being retrofitted because of work that— Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The government side will come to order. The government side will come to order. I apologize to the member for Don Valley West. Once again, start the clock. Recognize Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, everything we undertook was based on evidence and science, and so to the Minister of the Environment, I say you're welcome. But the young woman yesterday was not challenged. Stop the clock. The member for Don Valley West is an elected member of this House and has every right to ask a question, just like any other member of this House. And I need to be able to hear her. And this is twice that the government side, in huge numbers, has shouted her down. It's not acceptable behaviour. Restart the clock. Member for Don Valley West. Mr. Speaker, the young woman yesterday was challenging this government to care for the future. She was asking this government to think about her ability to live safely and securely, to have children of her own, free of the ravages of extreme weather and environmental degradation. Can the Premier please explain how the cancellation of successful programs that have led to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, how the, how the deletion of those programs will safeguard the future for that young woman and her entire generation. The question is to the Premier. Minister of Energy. Referred to the Minister of Energy. I'm sorry. I'm... Well, th th thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another, another great opportunity. A little bit rich coming from that member, Mr. Speaker. We saw what those projects cost the people of Ontario—17 to 48 cents a kilowatt, Mr. Speaker. While Liberal insiders got rich, yep. and the people of Ontario, families, seniors, and small businesses took the hit, especially out in northern Ontario. I can't think, Mr. Speaker, of a larger transfer of wealth than what occurred under the previous Liberal government and their irresponsible decisions, Mr. Speaker, around especially industrial wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. Yep. This was a dramatic error, Mr. Speaker. We have in introduced legislation Response. to fix the Hydro Mess Act. It's just been passed, and we're well on, a pa on the path, Mr. Speaker, to fix what they broke. Thanks. Supplementary question. You know, Mr. Speaker, we've actually seen this movie before because when that member was sitting in the federal parliament, Stephen Harper stood up and took credit for Canada being a leader in reduction of greenhouse gas emissions because of what was being done here in Ontario by the Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. We were reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Speaker, young people. Young people are by nature optimistic, and they should be, but they are worried about the environment as they should be. They're also worried about their education, and their parents are worried about their ability to care for their younger siblings. So this whole question is about the future, Mr. Speaker. They see this government removing the very supports that they rely on, cutting per pupil funding that will result in larger class sizes, increasing online courses in high school when we know question. from the research that fewer students will complete those courses, reducing student assistance grants that will mean higher debt and less access to post-secondary education, yep. cutting a billion dollars in social services that the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy to reply. Thank you. Minister of Environment. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm sure it must be frustrating for the member from Don Valley West to see the programs that, that she put in place, the programs that failed, the programs like a cap-and-trade program, Mr. Oh. Speaker, a program that the Auditor General explained to the, to the then Premier, but she wouldn't listen. She's going to transfer to hundreds of millions of dollars to California, Mr. Speaker. Why does she like California better than Ontario? Why does she like California taxpayers better than Ontario taxpayers? It must be upsetting to see a program put in place that is actually going to hit targets. Not miss targets like the programs that she put in place. A program that isn't based on benefiting Liberal insiders, but benefiting the people That's of Ontario. Right. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, our program is going to hit the targets that her federal prime minister, who she stood beside, agreed to the 30 per cent targets. Ah. Our program is going to do Bonds. that without a cap-and-trade program, without a carbon tax, and without subsidizing and picking winners oh and building electric truck factories for, for Warren Buffett or the other things that she's supported. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we have a real plan for Ontarians. And it's a Thank you. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question today is for another minister who makes things happen, our Minister of Infrastructure. Hey! Last Friday, last Friday I had the chance to uh, join the minister in the municipality of Tweed in my riding for a very exciting announcement. We announced funding for 49 road and bridge projects right across this province. These projects are part of our government's commitment to invest in critical infrastructure where it matters most. These 49 projects are the first that our government nominated in a 10-year, $30 billion infrastructure program known as the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Colleagues, this is an amazing news for rural and northern municipalities in Ontario. Smart infrastructure investments, they create jobs. They grow the economy and they, protect, and they protect what matters most to our families and our communities, our students and our businesses here in Ontario. And the Minister, tell us more about this program and how it impacts the people of Ontario. Mr. Infrastructure. 
Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Hastings, Lennox, and Addington for that excellent question and being with me uh, on Friday. Mr. Speaker, our government ran on a mandate to get Ontario moving. We announced funding for better roads and bridges in 49 different communities across Ontario on Friday. And Mr. Speaker, this is only the beginning. The majority of these projects can get started in this construction season with federal government support. I was glad to see last week, Mr. Speaker, that my honourable friend, Minister Champagne, declared that Ontario's priorities were his priorities. Good. He said he would work to speedily approve these projects, and Mr. Speaker, that is the right thing for the federal government to do. Mr. Speaker, these projects are valued at over $78 million, and this commitment is more proof that our government is protecting what matters most to the people. Good roads Response. and bridges get people to work and home safely so they can spend more time with the people they love. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker and uh, Minister, thank you for, you for that good news, great news, Ashley, and your continued guidance and support for our rural and northern communities. This announcement demonstrates that our government is absolutely committed to making the right infrastructure announcements. Mr. Speaker, Friday's announcement back in my riding took place outside the Boundary Ridge on Hawkins Bray in the municipality of Tweed. And I know personally from talking to all the people there how it impacts them and how much this investment for its replacement will absolutely positively affect their lives in that community. Mr. Speaker, six of these projects are located in my riding. Municipalities such as Tweed, Stone Mills, Tudor and Cashel, Hastings Highlands, Carlo Mayo, and Tyne the Native will benefit from over $9.4 million in funding for road and bridge projects. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us more about these 49 projects and how they are helping people right across this province of Ontario? Today? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would be happy to uh, answer that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, small and medium sized uh, towns are the fabric of our province. Projects just like the Boundary Bridge are infrastructure that people need. These investments are essential to the local quality of life and prosperity. They create jobs, grow our economy, and shape the future for hardworking families in Ontario. I can only imagine, Mr. Speaker, how much more we could accomplish if the previous Liberal government, supported by the opposition NDP, did not leave us stuck with a $15 billion deficit. Mr. Speaker, we're excited about these 49 projects. We are now awaiting approval by the federal government to go ahead. If they can do this, we can get shovels in the ground almost immediately. Mr. Speaker, we're protecting what matters most and getting Ontario Response. moving again. Our government is working harder, smarter, and more efficiently to make life better for the people of this province. Next question, the member for Beaches, East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, we learned that the government is cutting funding for the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office in half, defunding the office by $7.5 million. The Poverty Reduction Strategy Office works to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty, identify systemic barriers, and eliminate chronic homelessness. Instead of investing in strategies to alleviate poverty, the government has shown its true priorities. Can the Premier please explain why, once again, his government is making cuts on the backs of our most vulnerable citizens? The question is to the Premier. Minister of Children and Community Social Services. Refer to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. The member opposite and I have had Permit this side conversation come, many come times in this assembly. One in seven Ontarians live in poverty. Almost a million people rely on social assistance. That costs this province $10 billion, but does nothing to restore dignity. What does restore dignity is the creation of jobs in the province of Ontario. Since this government has taken office, we've been able to work with industry and business leaders to create an additional 160,000 jobs in addition to the 200,000 jobs that have remained vacant, which is why we are reforming social assistance so that those people who are, who are employable across this province have the dignity of work, have the compassion of a, of a group society where they're working with individuals. And we know, Speaker, that the best social program is a job. I understand that the members opposite would rather trap people into poverty. Government and this party want to lift them up so that they can succeed, and that's exactly what this government is doing. Order. 
Restart the clock. Supplementary question. In its recent poverty reduction strategy report, the government stated, as the minister did just now, that she's committed to supporting those who need it the most. But you cannot support those who need the help the most when you cut funding for the poverty reduction strategy office in half. You can't reduce poverty in Ontario when you don't understand how poverty works, as the minister just demonstrated. You can't reduce poverty in Ontario when you don't understand what systemic issues perpetuate it and when you don't have a plan and a commitment to making that change. Can the Premier explain how the government thinks slashing the poverty reduction strategy funding will actually help those living in poverty, many of whom cannot work, which is why the idea that a job is the solution is absolutely ridiculous? ridiculous. Minister, reply. Speaker. I come from a small town in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, where there wasn't big government. Neighbours helped Position neighbors, come to order. supported one another, and we made sure that those who could work could find suitable employment. I have no idea why the members opposite are so defeatist, why they are so opposed to a good day's work and a solid order. day's pay. I can tell Our you that this order. government for the people is committed to ensuring that we provide wraparound supports for those who can work. That is why I'm working with the Minister of Training and Universities so we can best provide the best wraparound supports for those who are employable to get into those 300 and some thousand jobs that we know exist in this province. That's why we're working with the Minister of Health so that we can provide the best mental health supports we possibly can. And that's why we're working with the Minister of Education so we can try to get more affordable daycare for moms, single moms out there who might have to stay on social assistance rather than get a job because they don't have affordable childcare. We have a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. The member for Ottawa Centre has to come to order. The member for Windsor Tecumseh has to come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain has to come to order. For repeated interjections in the last round of questions. Start the clock. I recognize the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I've worked well with the Minister in the past as advocates to end violence against women. Last week, I met with Aaron Lee, Executive Director of Lanark County Interval House, which provides critical services for victims of domestic violence. Aaron is very concerned and troubled that the Ministry unilaterally and without notice cancelled $53,000 in funding. In addition, none of the interval houses and women's shelters have received their 2019 budget package or their contract for services. Minister, this is not efficient. It certainly lacks accountability to have women's shelters operating without a budget. Will the minister commit to ending the practice of unilateral and hidden funding decisions that harm those who help victims of domestic violence. Questions to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I too met with uh, Aaron Lee last week of the Interval House. Uh, we had uh, all 48 of the Coordinating Committees for Violence Against Women uh, join us last week to talk about some of the issues that we face on the ground. But before I, I, I go into that, I want to say one thing to the member opposite. The reason we have a $1.5 million frontline rural strategy is, in essence, because of two, three members of this assembly um, who I serve with in opposition. And one is the member from Lanark, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington. The other is the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. And the third is from the member from Leeds and Grenville. Three strong men who have uh, consistently, time and again, stood in this legislature. And that's why we are investing an historic $74 million into uh, violence against women. That's why, above and beyond the previous Liberal administration, Response. we have increased the budget toward violence against women for an additional 2 per cent. I'll get into the more specifics in the supplemental, but I do want to congratulate the member for always standing true. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank, thank you, Minister. Yeah. Yesterday, during statements, I mentioned that elected representatives ought to practice in government what we preach well in opposition. The MCCSS year, the year-over-year estimates show a reduction of $17 million 
for women's shelters and supports for victims of violence from 172 to 155 million. In opposition, we both were very critical of government for leaving agencies and organizations in the dark on their funding. Yet we still have today these shel shelters operating in uncertainty. Without this critical budget information, both the shelters and the women and children they serve are living in the dark. Minister, will you call Aaron Lee and all the shelters this week and re reveal what their budgets are for 2019? Minister to reply. Thanks very much, Speaker. As I mentioned, I met with Aaron Lee as well as all 48 uh, uh, community um, groups last week. We're going to continue to have those conversations. In fact, I've spoken with the Minister of Health about convening a, a meeting with uh, with her with respect to mental health issues. But let me be perfectly clear where it comes to the numbers the member opposite is stating. These perceived reductions are due to the elimination of unfunded and unallocated resources from the Liberal campaign budget. That was irresponsible. Many of us in the social service types of portfolios have had to contend with a fictitious budget that was written on the back of a napkin. When it became clear, we ensured in this government that we increased the spend by almost 2 percent, or $11.5 million, in order to support women's shelters across the province of Ontario. My office continues to work with them, and we will continue to make our commitment to eradicate Response. violence against women as well as sex trafficking in the province of Ontario. There will be no fiercer critic than me on that Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for women's issues. Over the weekend, it was great to see so many memories and videos shared on social media celebrating mothers across Ontario. Our mothers are so often the most important women in our lives. I can say that's true in my case. Unfortunately, women still face barriers right here in Ontario. Too often, women earn less than their male counterparts, and countless women in our communities are confronted by sexual and domestic violence. Minister, can you please tell us how the government's working to break down these barriers and help keep women safe across the province? Minister responsible for women. Durham for always standing in this legislature and being a very strong advocate for women who are fleeing domestic violence as well as women who are dealing with sex trafficking. Uh, I've been a strong advocate in this assembly for many years, whether that is making Queen's Park more family-friendly so members like Christina Midas can bring their daughter on the floor of this assembly. I've been a strong advocate in making sure that we continue the work of, the, the, of Saving the Girl Next Door by Lori Scott, making sure that we're actually talking about eradicating sex trafficking in the province of Ontario. We're working with me members of this government to ensure that we continue to protect a woman's right to choose, and we were very clear about that just yesterday. But, Speaker, let me be perfectly clear. Last week I had the 48 uh, uh community uh, groups that uh, support violence uh, against women's initiatives, and we're going to continue to work with them. That's why we have an historic investment of $174.5 million, $1.5 million, as I mentioned in the previous question, uh, is dedicated to frontline support for those uh, in rural communities, and we're going to continue to stand up and we're going to continue to ensure that our voices are heard. But let me be perfectly clear, it's up to strong women to support vulnerable women, but it's also important for Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Violence against women has significant economic costs. I think people sometimes forget that. It's estimated that the economic impact of spousal violence in Canada is $7.4 billion. That amounts to roughly $220 per Canadian. While we've made progress to achieve greater gender equality, we must have women fully engaged in the political discourse. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how she's engaging women in this political discourse in Ontario? Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, I convened uh, Ontario's 48 uh, Existing Violence Against Women coordinating committees just last week. Some tremendous women and men from across the, the province making sure that we protect our most vulnerable. We must continue to have this conversation, however, because it is easy, particularly within, uh, within this ministry where Ontario's most vulnerable people rely on us to succeed, that we continue to tell the uncomfortable stories and the truths that are out there, which is why we're going to continue to work with those uh, coordinating committees, bring 
in other ministers so that they understand how we intersect uh, and, and help uh, violence against women and, and the survivors of that. We also want to make sure that we provide b best possible outcomes. Uh, speaker, we need to look um, and see what those, uh, what those uh, issues are um, at our, in our, all of our communities. And I think when we look at uh, building up society and we build up women, we must also make sure that men are part of that conversation, which is why just last Response. Friday I was pleased to spend some time with grade 7 and to 11 male students who are talking about manning up. And I think that we all have an opportunity here to talk to the men in our lives to make sure that they're protecting the most vulnerable women in society. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Since September, I have asked every minister responsible for anti-racism for a briefing. These requests have gone unanswered. In pursuit of answers, I was told to be patient and to wait for the estimates, which I, which I was assured would show the government's plan for anti-racism work. While the anti-racism directorate was listed in the estimates, I was disturbed to see that there was only $1,000 dedicated to, quote, anti-racism initiatives. Oh. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier please explain to the people of Ontario what kind of work $1,000 can do to combat racism, which is sadly on the rise in the province? Wow. Question is to the Premier. Solicitor General. Referred to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, um, the, the member opposite is using numbers that, frankly, uh, have no basis in fact. We have relied on the, the, uh, the anti-racism directorate to drive our legislative agenda. Uh, the the uh, OPS employees that work in this directorate do excellent work, and we use that when we are doing things like updating the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act, when we look at policy changes, we make sure that there is their voice and their input, impact is, is very important to us. You know, there, there is no doubt that anti-racism in all its forms is completely unacceptable to our government, and we will continue to, we will continue to work with our partners to make sure that we drive decisions based on that input. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier. The story that these estimates tell us is that the Conservatives are just not interested in doing racial justice work. They're unwilling to take concrete steps towards racial equity. There's money allocated to staff and advertising, but no money to do the actual anti-racism work. No money to invest in the organizations and programs which are making progress on these issues, and no money to resource the Black, Indigenous, Jewish, and Muslim anti-racism subcommittees that this government quietly disbanded despite hate crimes being on the rise. Does the Premier believe that we can solve racism with $1,000? Questions been referred to the Selection General. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, again, I will say, I will reinforce that there is no room in a, uh, in a Ford government that would in any way allow anti-racism to continue in the province of Ontario. We are actively engaged in working with the directorate. We will continue that work. But let's be clear. We are asking everyone across Ontario to play a small part in ensuring that we bring Ontario's fiscal uh, health back Opposition to, come to order. In a small way, we will ask all organizations and agencies that are transfer partners that are part of our uh, ability to ensure that Ontario's fiscal health returns to balance because at the end of the day, we have to make sure as a government, as uh, citizens, Response. that we protect what matters most. We will do that. We will do that with the excellent uh, partners that we have, and we will make sure that we are bringing forward policies and, and ideas that actually Thank you. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, thank you. My uh, question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. This past June, our government was elected with a mandate to stand up for Ontario's rural, northern and Indigenous communities. These regions had long been neglected by the previous government. In fact, Mr. Speaker, my pre predecessor famously called Northern Ontario no man's land. 
Over those 15 years, Ontarians saw investments grind to a halt, and those looking to grow and expand their business face roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Outdated and redundant red tape and lack of infrastructure and resources and meaningful dialogue with our municipalities prevented these regions from reaching their full economic potential. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House about the work our government is doing to ensure that Ontario's rural communities remain sustainable and viable places to live, work, and raise a family? Yeah. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for that excellent question. Our government is committed to working with our rural communities to ensure they have the resources they need to attract investment, create jobs, and boost economic development. That's why last week I was proud to announce that our government has committed to revitalizing the Rural Economic Development, or RED, program. The Rural Economic Development program will continue to support projects that diversify and grow local economies. It will now also target more impactful projects, tangible community benefits such as reducing the burden for applicants and creating efficiencies in program delivery. This program is just one of the tools that our government is utilizing to ensure that Ontarians' taxpayer dollars are respected while delivering results for our rural communities. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and for the work he's doing to promote rural economic development. I know that rural residents in my riding are happy that our government is creating more opportunity for rural Ontario. We're creating an environment where our job creators can thrive, especially those in rural Ontario. In less than a year, Mr. Speaker, we've seen investments open, two streams, rural and northern, public transit that have meant shovels in the ground in my community, shovels in the ground in my colleagues' community, and across rural Ontario. Because our government knows that when our rural communities thrive, Ontario thrives. Could the minister please expand upon how our government is supporting job creation and economic growth across rural Ontario? Minister to reply. To the, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to refer to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. To the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks. I'd like to uh, thank the Minister of Agriculture for sharing this morning, and I'd like to thank my good friend and my neighbour in eastern Ontario, Mr. Pacini, for the question this morning. Our government came into office with a commitment to create jobs, not just in the big cities like Toronto and in Ottawa, but to ensure that we're creating good jobs right across Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we're reducing red tape across Ontario. That's why we're lowering the hydro rates, and that's why we're lowering taxes so that businesses across Ontario can succeed. We're creating creating an environment where job creators can create more jobs. Through Bill 66, Restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act, Mr. Speaker, we removed burdensome red tape affecting our agriculture sector, and I'd like to thank again my colleague, the Minister of Agriculture, for helping out on that file, making it easier for farmers to register online, to eliminate costly, outdated standards under the Milk Act, and reducing Response. paperwork for meat processors as well, Mr. Speaker. All good things to create jobs in rural Ontario. We're working with our communities to ensure that Ontario is open for business everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the Restart the clock. Next question, member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in November, the Premier's Minister of Finance said, and I quote, I look at the young people who are here today and I think about the debt that you are inheriting and it saddens me. What saddens me, Mr. Speaker, is that this government is directly downloading $414 million in student debt onto young people. Is the Premier not saddened by the hundreds of millions of dollars in additional debt that students have to take on because of his callous cuts to OSAP? Question is to the Premier. Minister of Training and Colleges and Universities. Or to the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government is taking action to deliver on its promises to the people of Ontario yep. and restore trust and accountability in Ontario's finances. We promise the people of Ontario to create good jobs, and we want to ensure that Ontarians have the skills they yep. need to fill those jobs. Post-secondary education is critical to the future of Ontario and our next generations. Our government has been clear that we will balance the budget in a responsible manner, 
and deliver on our promise to restore accountability and trust in Ontario's finances. The previous Liberal government created a $15 billion deficit, made Ontario the most indebted subnational jurisdiction in all of, on, all of the world and was spending $40 million a day more than they brought in. If left unchecked, the deficit will put essential services like health care education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier. In October, the Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities said in this House, and I quote, Unlike the previous Liberal government, we know that we have a responsibility to our young people to invest in their education and not to leave them with an unsustainable debt load for their children and grandchildren. Yes. There's a contradiction here. Now, there's a contradiction between the minister's words and the actions of this government, yet when the minister fails to understand is that her actions to cut $650 million from colleges and universities and over $400 million from OSAP will leave our children and grandchildren with even more student debt. Why does the premier and his ministers want students to start their life under a mountain of debt? Thank you. Referred to the minister of training and colleges and universities. Thank you, Speaker. And again, thank you, the member opposite, for the question, Speaker. Unlike the previous Liberal government propped up by the NDP, we are balancing Ontario's budget Order. in a responsible manner while protecting what matters most to the people of Ontario. And if left unchecked, the deficit threatens essential services that the people of Ontario rely on. In terms of the figure, you know, and the th things you mentioned. I can say that the figure represents post-secondary reforms, including our historic 10 per cent reduction in tuition for all Ontario students, which will provide Ontario students $450 million in tuition relief. And by lowering tuition across the entire province, our government is ensuring that all qualified Ontario students Response. will have more access to high-quality skills training and education. Speaker, we are focused on protecting the services that matter most to the people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Kitchener Centre has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Solicitor General concerning resourcing the anti-racism work in Ontario. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Government House Leaders inform me he has a point of order. Thanks, Speaker. I seek unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding the parliamentary assistance responding to the late shows scheduled for Tuesday, May 14, 2019. Government House Leader is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to put forward a motion regarding the late shows tonight. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Once again, the Government House Leader. Speaker, I move that notwithstanding Standing Order 38B, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Environment may respond to the late show scheduled for Tuesday, May 14th, by the member for Brampton Centre in place of the parliamentary assistant to the Premier, and that the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may respond to the late show scheduled for Tuesday, May 14th, by the member for Guelph in place of the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance, and that the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health may respond to the late show scheduled for Tuesday, May 14th by the member for Essex in place of the parliamentary assistant to the Premier. That was all made sense. The government House Leader has moved that notwithstanding Standing Order 38B, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of the Environment may respond to the late show scheduled for Tuesday, May 14, by the member for Brampton Centre. Dispense? Dispense? Dispense. Dispense? Yes. Is, it all, is it the pleasure of the House for the motion carried? Carried. Carried. Point of order, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. I'd just like to welcome Parkdale High Park constituent Krista Slavinsky, who is a practicing physician assistant at Toronto General Hospital. Thank you. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.